Hello, welcome back to General Chemistry. My name is Daniel and today we're going to be looking at quantum mechanics. We're going to start off by looking at the nature of light, how light, what light's composed of, how it travels, its energy, etc. Later in this video we're going to get into the atomic side of quantum mechanics. So we're going to look at orbitals, emission spectra, quantum numbers, and other ways that we can describe the, what's going on in the electrons in any kind of atomic system. So start with, we're going to look at waves. So this is just a basic sine wave on the bottom here. And we can describe it with the following three properties. First is the wavelength. The wavelength of any wave is just the distance between two consecutive points. So for example, on the example down here, our wavelength is just the distance between the two maximum peaks on the wave. The related to that is frequency. Frequency is just the number of waves that pass through a given point per second. So if I just made an arbitrary point right here, let's say, this wave travels towards the right here, as this arrow indicates. And depending on how many wavelengths pass in a given amount of time, that will be our frequency. And the last thing we can look at is amplitude. So amplitude is just kind of like the intensity of a wave. So it's a measure of the midpoint to either a minimum or a maximum. And they're going to be the same for um, a normal wave. So the bottom points here, these minima down here, these are called troughs. The top parts up here are called crests. Now, the reason we're looking at waves is that all light and, um, you know, visible light from the sun, UV light from the sun, microwaves, radio waves, etc., is all in the form of what's called electromagnetic radiation. And what happens in electromagnetic radi radiation is that you have two waves perpendicular to each other. On one plane, you have a magnetic field, mark it in red. On another plane, you have an electric field, and they're perpendicular to each other. That means that ni they're 90 degrees apart. And what happens then is that they prop the wave itself propagates in a perpendicular a perpendicular direction compared to the two waves as well. So you'll see down here that we have the electric field going up, we have the magnetic field going into the page, out of the page, and then we have the propagation going in a third perpendicular direction. So that's the wave, kind of the wave nature of any light we'll be looking at. Now light also has a characteristic speed. Given a vacuum, it's always going to travel at this constant c. And c is just equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, what we can do with that value is we can relate the wavelength and frequency of any given electromagnetic wave. So in any instance, the wavelength and f times the frequency, this here is frequency, it's a new wavelength here is a lambda. What we can do is, anytime we multiply those two together, it's always going to equal the speed of light, which is a constant. And so that's going to help us interconvert between wavelength and frequency. So let's say we wanted to find the wavelength of something given a frequency. We would just rearrange this equation to say that the wavelength just equals c divided by our frequency. And that's how we can interconvert between our frequency and our wavelength. And another important thing to note is that these two are indirectly proportional to one another. So that means higher wavelengths mean lower frequency and vice versa. And that makes sense. If you have a longer distance to travel in a given amount of time, you're going to get through less cycles of, you know, that given time, right? So this, info, this graphic here is just showing the spectrum of possible wavelengths and frequencies for electromagnetic waves. So on the far left end over here, we have gamma rays, which have the lowest, w smallest wavelength. And on the right side, we have radio waves, which have the longest wavelength, about 10 to the 3 meters, if you go into the um, AM, FM range. And in between there, we have 
X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwaves. The ones we're going to be focusing on for most of this are the visible spectrum. And you see kind of a, um, a, a blow up of that on the bottom. So the visible region of light is actually extremely small. It's only ranging about 350 nanometers here. But it makes up a lot of what our eyes detect and what we, um, what we see in some chemical phenomena. Right? So on a related note to that, we noticed that there was a, a wide range of wavelengths going on in that graphic. And we can use the wavelength and frequency to quantify the energy of those waves. So the energy is just going to equal NHV, NH nu, I should say, sorry. Or if we converted that, it would be NHC over lambda. Now H is just Planck's constant. It's just a um, constant that you can look up. N is just a whole number integer. So that means N equals 1, N equals 2, N equals 3. And an important thing to note from that is that the energy of a wave is quantized. And that means it can only occur in specific whole, num whole integer multiples. So for example, you couldn't have N equal to 1.5. Can't do that. And it's going to be important later when we're looking at atomic spectra, this, uh, this quantization of electromagnetic radiation. And another important thing to note, we have our energy is directly proportional to our frequency, but indirectly proportional to our wavelength. So what we can say is that if we have a high frequency, we have high energy. But if we have a high wavelength, we have low energy. All right, it's going to be very important that you remember that kind of relationship there. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit now that we understand the energy of waves, how to look at them via wavelength and frequency and their speed, and we're going to look at the nature of light. Now, back in the early 1900s, Einstein did experiments on the photoelectric effect. This is, in fact, what he won the Nobel Prize in physics on. And what the photoelectric effect effect is is just it's the ejection of electrons from a metal when it's hit by a certain threshold frequency of light and since we're looking for a threshold frequency we could also say that it's a threshold energy as well so an important thing to note with the photoelectric effect is that electrons on the surface of a metal are attracted and bound by um, attractive forces. You know, you'll have positive charges within the metal, they attract the electron. And this is a different, it's a different degree of attraction for each metal, and that's what's called the work function. The work function just describes how strongly bound an electron is. So, to eject an electron, we need a certain energy, H nu, and that's going to equal the kinetic energy of the ejected electron, and we also have to add in the fact that there's a work function we have to overcome. And that's how we derive this equation here. So we could be given a work function of x. We could have a kinetic energy of y. And you would just find, figure out, based on this simple equation, what the energy or wavelength or frequency of the light that's required to um, eject electrons through this. Now. The one important thing, and the thing that Einstein discovered, or postulated, I should say, that won him the Nobel Prize was the fact that the photoelectric effect can't really be explained by having light acting as a wave. Because what happened is, given two beams of equal frequency but different intensity, different amounts of electrons would be knocked out. But if they have the same frequency, that would mean they have the same energy too. So that doesn't make any sense. So something else had to be there. And what Einstein postulated was the existence of this particle called photons. Photons are literally particles of light. Photons.